I'll be honest with you. I've been putting this video off for a long time. This script has taken weeks of research and even longer just procrastinating over how to say it. Because this is a knife edge topic. It's incredibly sensitive and look, I get it. I'm an angler too and I've seen the damage on the bank and I feel the frustration. But that is exactly why I don't just want to rant. I believe we need to look at the facts. So I've done the deep dive. I've read the scientific papers, the government reports, and the impact assessments to get the truth. And this is what I've found. This is Waterside Predators, episode four, The Cormorant. To the average person, this is just a bird drying its wings on a post. To the angler, it's one of the biggest threats to the future of our sport. We've all seen it, a water that used to hold roach, rudd, trout, and other fish, wiped clean. The anger is real, the damage is visible. But to beat this predator, you have to understand it. Today we're looking at the hard science of the cormorant conflict. Are they an invasive pest that needs eradicating? Or are they a symptom of something else? First, let's address the elephant in the room, or rather, the bird on the lake. Anglers often ask, why are they here and why now? The answer lies in a specific chain of events. Historically, the UK only had the Phalacrocorax carbocarbo, the great cormorant, a coastal bird that largely stayed on the cliffs. But in 1979, the European Union introduced the Birds Directive, giving cormorants full protection across the continent. The result? A population explosion. In the Netherlands and Denmark, numbers skyrocketed, and by the late 1980s, those habitats were full. The population needed to go somewhere, and they looked west. This brought a massive influx of a different subspecies, the Phalacrocorax carbocinensis, and this is crucial. Unlike our native coastal birds, Sinensis is a freshwater specialist. They are evolutionary designed to hunt in fresh waters and nest in trees. They didn't get lost inland. They moved into a niche that was wide open. They aren't visitors anymore. They're residents. So, what is the cost? Science tells us an adult cormorant needs about half a kilo of fish a day just to fuel its metabolism. Now, if we do the math, a flock of 30 birds on a small gravel pit, that's 15 kilos of fish extracted every single day. That's over 100 kilos a week. This isn't just about biomass, it's about bankruptcy. Reports on the economic consequences of cormorant predation highlight that for fisheries and aquaculture, this isn't just a nuisance, it's a direct threat to commercial viability. On stocked waters, they are known to follow the stocking lorries, hitting the fish before they've even acclimatized. It isn't anecdotal, it's biomass removal on an industrial scale. If you want to know why anglers are angry, you only have to look at the Angling Trust Cormoran Impact Reports. They have long catalogued the devastation on a national level, but the specific site data is even more chilling. Take the River Usk, for example. Natural Resources Wales produced a report on observations on fish-eating birds during the smelt run. They found that in some stretches, up to 40% of tagged Atlantic salmon smelts were lost during migration, and it's a tag team effort. The Spring 2021 survey of cormorant and goosander on the River Usk showed that while cormorant numbers dropped in spring, goosander numbers remained high at pinch points intercepting the migrating fish. When a predator takes more biomass than the ecosystem can replenish, that's not balance, that's collapse. Additionally, a study by Stuart et al. revealed the true scale of the impact at Loch Leven in Scotland, a world-renowned trout fishery. Over a single seven-month period, researchers estimated that cormorants consumed over 80,000 brown trout and 5,000 rainbows. Now, if we compare that to anglers in that same year, the total rod catch was 12,815 rainbows and 5,828 brown trout. Now, if we do the math, 
That's 14 times more fish removed by the cormorant. So the obvious answer, shoot them. Cormorants are protected, but licenses exist. Natural England issues them for damage. Natural Resources Wales has trialled them for conservation. But this is where the conflict gets messy. On one side, you have BirdLife International. They argue that culling is a complete waste of time. Their data suggests that shooting birds locally is just scapegoating a native predator for our own environmental failures, like pollution and habitat loss. Crucially, they point to the vacuum effect. If you shoot 10 birds, the sheer pressure of the European population, millions strong, means 10 more just fly in to take their place. On the other hand, you have the Anglin Trust. For years, they've been fighting to get cormorants added to the general license. They argue the current system is woefully in inadequate, a tangle of red tape where license decisions can take months, leaving fisheries defenseless while the damage is actually happening. Yet recently, the law has started to shift. There are moves towards a pan-European management plan to coordinate control across borders, recognising that you can't fix a migration issue with a local shotgun. But the, for the fishery owner standing on the bank today, Political promises don't save fish. The shotgun is a blunt instrument, and right now, the law makes it a slow one. Dr. Ian Russell at Cephas led trials on using fish refuges, artificial underwater bunkers. The concept is simple. If the fish has a roof over its head, the cormorant can't dive bomb it. The government-backed tests found that these refuges could reduce predation kills by up to two-thirds. Now, bird conservationists will argue the cormorant is a native species. Anglers will argue it's an unchecked threat. But while the debate rages on, fish are still disappearing. This is bigger than a UK debate. A global meta-analysis on cormorant predation confirms that this pressure on fish populations is a worldwide issue. But for the angler on the bank today, international plans don't save fish. The hard reality is that we are fighting a predator that is protected by law and perfectly adapted to our waters. It feels like fighting with one hand tied behind your back. We can't change the bird's instinct and right now we can't easily change the legislation. That leaves us with only one variable that we can control, the water itself. They are efficient, they are relentless and we share these waters with them, whether we like it or not. I just want to be clear, I'm not pro or anti-cormorant. They aren't evil. They're just doing exactly what evolution designed them to do. But the reality is, we have created an environment where they can't lose, and native fish can't win. Unless something changes, they are here to stay. The cormorant is a master predator. The question is, can our fish stocks withstand this level of pressure in the future? Well, that's a wrap on season one. We've covered mink and otters, watched kingfishers strike with precision, and today looked head on at the cormorant conflict. And if you've seen the cormorant vacuum effect yourself or found something that works, tell me below. Let's keep it civil, but let's keep it honest. And if you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe because season two is on the way. This is Waterside Predators, and until next time, stay hooked. I'm Stu, a British military veteran, and predator angling runs deep in my veins. It's about wild waters, the chase, and a way of life. If you enjoyed this adventure, hit subscribe. And if you wanna go even further, join my channel memberships for raw, unfiltered predator sessions and exclusive films you won't see anywhere else. This is hooked on predator fishing and until next time stay hooked.